Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of various stories from across the internet. In this series, we will be focusing on the web novel There Is No Epic Lucia, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we will be doing chapters 13 to 15. I hope that you enjoy. There Is No Epic Lucia, Only Puns, Chapter 13, Hook, Line and sinker. Delta edged closer to the Great Mushy. It danced back and forth as it was still unsure of its new shape and size. She was just going to touch it and walk away. Delta could do that much, just one little touch. Closer and closer, Delta neared the death plant. With the trembling fingers, Delta reached out. This was silly. She was the dungeon core. She shouldn't be afraid of over half the things that she made. The great bushy goggled its acid, and Delta turned and fled. Screw it, she'll grow her spine later. Grumbling as she walked down past the spider room, and praying to whomever was listening, purchased the spider upgrade. She peeked around the corner at the manor rose, and the spiders shivered, and the little white lines appeared around their butts, parts, and that was it. Delta cheered and watched as the new web coming out of the spiders seemed to be more silvery than white. It was a little bead points that were the webs connected was pretty, like snowflakes caught in a web. Delta hoped that people would like the web, nothing else. The woman, Rudy, seemed very pleased that the normal web, so this should be good, right? Delta pondered what else she could do with the floating down the hall. For the first time in forever, her DP was only at a lowly 31. Heading into the grove, she peered around and then opened a menu. Grove upgrades have edible mushrooms grow in their own in the room, 5 dp. Have lumen mushrooms grow on their own in the room, 5 dp. It was a nice touch. She could just have some unknown number of mushrooms she created spawn on their own over time. Develop. Develop mushrooms with weak hallucinogenic properties, 6 dp. Develop mushrooms with a deadlier poison, 49 dp. Her previous purchases hadn't unlocked any more, and Delta would be damned before she would help the gut rot evolve past their annoying existence into true threat. The other mushroom felt interesting, in a I-really-shouldn't kind of way. Scrolling, Delta wondered what she would have to do to unlock better mushrooms that didn't make her want to scream. Just because she had a vendetta against the things didn't mean that she wanted people outside to miss out on the potential life-changer. Delta wasn't that petty. Thinking, she looked around at the mulch and soil. Her finger hovered over the wine plant in 15 dp. That would leave her 16 dp, which was more than enough to evolve one of her goblins. Delta pondered the options the plant could potentially give antidotes, and maybe, being near the poisonous mushrooms, it would produce better antidotes. Medicine was never wrong choice when it came to non-harmful testing. Evolving one of her goblins? It would have to be one of the new pair that she had made, possibly Francois. Hob and Gob were rares and seemed to work on another system entirely. Delta again, sticking to her code, asked why she wanted to evolve the goblins. First, as friendly as she wanted to be, she couldn't put her safety in the hands of strangers. Having more powerful, if she needed it, was being sensible. Delta didn't know anything about the world. Who ruled it? What was the dungeon laws? How could Delta make sure that she wasn't invaded and used like some magical vending machine until she was insane? Evolve some firepower. She felt a little bit unsure about it, however. What if evolving a monster made her dungeon appear as dangerous? There was no answer. When there was no answer to be had, Delta did what she always did and decided to play it by ear. One step at a time. She placed the plant in a small clearing and partially hidden by the large mushrooms in the grove. The plant appeared from the ground, growing up in a speed-up fashion, until three healthy green leaves flopped out from the stem. It was a pretty normal plant besides the odd yellow stem. Delta jumped as the ordinary boar of the grove walked past and sniffed at the new addition. The mushroom-loving pig dismissed it and walked off. It quickly blended in with between the fungi and vanished from sight. Delta knew where it was, but it's still surprising to see how easily it disappeared from view. Delta opened the menu, but no option to have the plant respawn appeared. She frowned and she moved on. The mushroom grown must be fine-tuned to mushrooms only. She should have figured out a way to keep the plant respawning. 
as the 12 mana to summon it wasn't cheap. Delta was about to move over to Francois to begin his evolution. That was when the, all the menus vanished and that feeling returned. Delta spun at what was the entrance a moment later. Her heart fluttered with an excitement as Ruli appeared whistling. Over one shoulder was a fishing rod. Her black hair looked tied up and her chiffle jacket seemed replaced by a simple shirt. In her other hand was a large burlock sack. Hey Dungeon, sorry to be back so soon and stuff. I hope you aren't busy. I came here to fish and I brought this little gift for you, for being here and not, you know, adventuring. Rudy said loudly and she dropped a sack down and left the dungeon for a moment. Delta stunned. Tribute? Rudy knew that her menus didn't work. The sack melted and soon as Rudy was out of the dungeon. Bent fork has been absorbed. Leather book with a hole has been absorbed. Tiny wax candle has been absorbed. Soak red diary has been absorbed. Cracked arrow has been absorbed. This was Delta coughed and tried not to feel confused as Rudy basically fed Delta her trash. It was super useful for Delta and sure her menus were going to be amazing after this all. But still, this was a little rude. Rudy came back in. So, I've loved that forked. Save me from a not quite dire wolf. The leather book was good but I lost the other one during a trek into the Demondo swamp and was filled with his gators like you would not believe. Rudy said brightly and started to walk down the tunnel. Delta followed, ogling the strange woman who was just talking to thin air as if Delta could understand her existence. The candle was the last of a hundred or so. Save my life in a cave spelunking accident. Diary is kind of sad for me. Lost a lot of good memories when that jerk quest soaked me with rainwater. You can have it. Maybe you can read it. I hear that some dungeons can do that. The books are split out perfect copies and things into the book. Ruli kept talking and paused when she entered the spider room. Damn, you work fast. Ruli called and she eyed the new web forming in the room. Th thank you, Delta said, feeling horrible about her comments towards Ruli's tributes. Ruli didn't hear her, but she moved on. She readied her knife and then stopped as she saw the mushy hadn't returned. Sorry about that. Hope that monster doesn't set you back too far. Ruli said with an easy smile. Delta wanted to hug the strange woman and never let her leave. Human contact. It was like water when Delta didn't know that she was thirsty. The lack of proper contact was driving her mad. Uh, kind of curious. Mind if I go take a look down the hall? Ruli asked the wall, despite Delta being behind her. Sure, just watch out. There's a mud and you have nice hair. Delta waved in panic. Rooney took a stroll down, and that was when Delta saw that since her room had no doors, Rooney could just peek in and whistle. Nice. I've got to make Chris do this. She grinned, and she pushed her fishing pole into the mud and looked surprised. Ha! Huh. Rooney commented and turned back around. Not to be rude, but you forgot that a rock or spikes or something. Rooney said with good nature. Delta felt a brush coming on. No dangers. She twiddled her fingers together and she mumbled. Ruli whistled as she headed back towards the pond. This one-sided conversation was driving her mad. Delta thought about it and rushed over to Hob as he was sitting at the camp. Hob, I need your help. She called and the goblin stood at attention. He soared at his side. Orders, master? He asked and Delta directed him down the hall. If she couldn't speak directly to Rudy, then she would use the dime mouthpiece to do it. Hob looked at the mud room and he was face scrunched up and he took the first jump. Left, then right, then left and then forward. Delta groaned as Hob tumbled into the mud with a splat. He was always mixed up with a bit going out. Thankfully the wall had a little holes in it to climb on, on both sides. Hob crawled out and dragged the mud along the tunnel. Delta peered and saw Ruli setting up a little wooden stool and she had the odd pack. No, don't attack or scream. Delta peered in and saw Ruli sitting on a little wooden stool as if she had an odd backpack. No, do not attack or scream. Delta warned and Hob looked like Delta had just cancelled Christmas or Gobsmas. Now repeat after me, began Delta. Ruli was in a mood. The meeting was over, Chris skulked off somewhere and Ruli was fishing. A good way to end the day, in her opinion. It would take something spectacular to ruin her mood now. Oi! Something spectacular spoke from behind her. Ruli had already turned, knife in hand. The sight of a stinking mud-covered gob with his hands up 
was not a sight that she was accustomed to. Gobs screamed and attacked. There really wasn't much else to the basic ones. This one held its gaze and kept its hands up in surrender. I come with words. It said and Rudy raised an eyebrow, in surprise, but her aim never faltered. I am Delta, Dungeon Core. The gob repeated carefully, and this time Ruli's aim did slip. What did you say, gob? She asked, almost spitting out the question, and the little green fella snarled and almost rose to her bait. Mud spluttered as he moved, but she stopped, when he visibly flinched at something. I am gob, in service of Delta. Delta is core. The gob said, mouth working awkwardly around the big words. Ruli wanted to disagree on principle, but decided not to shank the gob for another minute. What if there was right? The dungeon was communicating and Rudy would be shooting the messenger or stabbing it. Master comes to you, dungeon. Master thanks you, forgives. The goblin became more confident and sadly worse with his words. The mud covered gob looking proud as he completely butchered his words and was nothing Rudy was comfortable with. Thank you, Delta, she repeated, and the gob nodded. Master, have Q. Co. He's confused. He tried to interpret what the dungeon was telling him. Questions? Ruli said, holding her knife very tightly. The gob nodded and Ruli hesitated. This was not normal. Dungeons talking to people was recorded and known to happen. Those dungeons happened to be 50 plus floors behemoths with calls the size of boulders and the intellect to match. Then again, Quiss and herself never checked to see the flaws. Quiss sounded so sure that it was new, and if he had been wrong, and this entrance was some new power of the dungeon, and they were still sitting on a world of wonder. Ask your questions, dungeon, but answer me this, so that I know this gob isn't tricking me. What is 4 plus 4 minus 5? Rudy called after a moment, and the gob blinked. Tree, it answered smugly. Well, Rudy couldn't argue with that. Dungeon Core Delta, I am pleased to meet you, Ruli said clearly and slowly. There was no telling what state of development the Core was at. Ruli would just have to calm and honest. This was also meant that she could hold this over Quiss. Ruli knew the dungeon could hear her. It probably decided to reveal itself after Ruli's tribute and friendly talk. Some dungeons were like animals, sensing intentions and not caring for words. Some dungeons might only take people on word value, dismissing context, sarcasm and humor. The core of Castrum was known to like a good joke. Do mans lie dungeons? The gob soused and Rudy blinked at the question, do people like dungeons? Jeez, talk about a hard question. Rudy decided to take the human way and focus on the trouble from the dungeon alone. Yeah, almost always. Some dungeons can be bad, but we think you're good, Rudy said slowly and wondered what Quiss would do if he was here. Yes, well then, you can talk, now leave me alone to fish. Yeah, this was better left to Rudy's tender care. What's bad? The gob itched at a large nose and Rudy shrugged. If you make things that make people sick, illnesses or viruses, or if you, well, it's hard to explain, but if you're going to go insane, you know what that is. Ruli asked and hoped that the gob listened. Act not right. The gob translated. Ruli sighed with relief. It was honestly scary how fast this dungeon was understanding her. It was new. Ruli thought back to the many dungeons that she had been in before and knew that this wasn't like that. The dungeon had something none of those had. Dungeon called Delta, she began and the gob cleared its throat. Master said, you called Delta. He added sourly, as if to really hope that Rudy would say no, which definitely made Rudy agree. Delta, how many levels do you have? She asked and then spoke quickly and the gob opened his mouth. If you don't mind telling me, she smiled and the gob shrugged and held up one clawed finger. Just one level. Delta, this dungeon core, outthinking course is level times the size with one level. That was... So far from any dungeon stats that she knew, and really knew a lot about dungeons. This dungeon was went from an odd to a little scary. Rudy felt sweat gather from her forehead and she felt stupid. She had faced down beasts that would chew up everything in here like nothing. Rudy took a breath and then asked another question. Do you know what the most dungeons don't talk until they have 20 or so floors? She pushed the fact out there and the gob looked up at the ceiling as if waiting. Time stretched and only the goblin looked a little nervous before he sighed with relief and then spoke. No, master only know this dungeon. So the gob shrugged and Rudy nodded. 
That made sense. Dalton most likely knew how special it was. Boy or girl, or rather, Rudy suddenly asked, deciding that she needed pronouns. It might not be too much for the core to fully grasp gender just yet, and that was girl. McGob said with a confused tone. Rudy blinked and then nodded. She decided that she would let Delta talk. Master asks if man's will end her. McGob growled and questioned out, and Rudy was pretty sure that she had just told the core that people liked a dungeon in its uses. The goblin listened to more. If master made gobs, big gobs, it added, and Rudy clicked her mouth shut and then tried to translate that in her head. Goblins into big goblins, like thugs or shamans, like evolution. Rudy repeated the word out loud and the goblin nodded enthusiastically. And Rudy just grinned. Sister, we're counting on it. Dungeons grow so that we kind of expect to see new monsters soon. But to be honest, your dungeon isn't that hard. You need traps and stuff. Rudy said with a carefree voice, and the gob winced. It looked a little lost for words, but at the remote, it repeated the core Dalta's edict. Master, not one kill. Master, not one death. And the goblin whispered. Dalta didn't want to kill. Dalta didn't want death in her dungeon. Rudy inhaled, and for once in her life, she felt speechless. Rudy tried to think what the world would do if they learned of Delta a pacifist dungeon, and she gripped her fishing rod so hard that she heard the wood creak. The Fair Play Company, the girls, the merchants, the teenagers, and the monsters. Delta would be devoured and turned into a quivering shell as if this world used her. Rudy dropped her fishing rod and looked at the gob. Delta, please don't trust humans. This world, we humans, enslave dungeons for profit. You will be gouged out and built around by people who see you as a wonderful place, as nothing but numbers and loot drops. You can't not kill. Rudy pleaded and the gob shuddered suddenly. Must be way. The gob almost sounded human for a moment. I don't know. I've never heard of a dungeon that cared about life enough to try. Rudy admitted and the gob looked up. Master, make sad sounds. He called and Rudy watched the goblin, looked at her and ran away. Rudy felt like she had won over Quiss and really didn't care much for it. This was worse than she thought. Way worse. Rudy felt that the piece of garbage that didn't even deserve to be eaten by the dungeon. Someone who's a jerk and could ignore hurting the dungeon's feelings long enough to help it. And she needed someone who didn't do anything important or have too much pride for her to bully them into doing it. Rudy needed Quiss. End of chapter. There is no epic loot here. Holy puns. Chapter 14. Conviction. Delta sat quietly as Quiz stalked about the pond room and Ruli snapped questions at him. She hugged her knees, lacking any sort of physical limbs. It was mostly the sort of feeling, really. Delta's mood seemed to be summed up as somewhat not good. Rudy's words swam about in her head over and over, but Delta just waited as Quiz argued with Francois. Delta wasn't sure if she was so happy to have the people so close now. Rudy's message seemed pretty blunt and what Delta would have to do. Not because she was a maniac, or because people would come for her, and if Rudy's tone had been any indication, Delta didn't want to be a murderer, not even by proxy. Delta also didn't want a life of pain and misery. The coin flipped endlessly in the air, one thing being the death of people and the other being the death for Delta. It would spin for now, but Delta felt her mood darken as she knew that it wouldn't last forever. The only upside was that the manor was nearly full, and that was pretty interesting, and she wondered how fast her manor region would be if her dungeon was full of people. She relayed this question to the two guests with Francois' help. It depends. A mage like myself or a decent hunter like Rudy would provide ample mana due to our natural stores. We both possessed a decent share. Mine is naturally higher, of course, and an average farmer would give you about a fraction of that. It's natural evolution and competition between people and dungeons, you see. People become stronger over time to reduce more mana. They grow bored and have the weak dungeons and move on to stronger dungeons where their strength is challenged, and the dungeon that needs more mana receives stronger sources of mana to draw upon. Quiss sniffed, Rudy rolled her eyes. Don't let nerds like Quiss fool you. you. We can't actually measure how much mana people have. Dungeons can be done with the guessing and time. People, in a general estimate, still, this mage can cost 20 fireballs compared to this guy that managed to cost 100. 
can also give you a decent idea instead of wasting time calculating stars, ruins, souls, and the hubbub with the mana point count. Rudy sniggered as Quiz hesitated and then agreed. Mana points are a flux system of calculators. Quiz said quite dryly, and Delta was absorbed all of this with a great interest. Calculators? The goblin managed and Quiz's face became pained. Rudy snorted and the attempt, but Francois showed no signs of shame at his words. Calculators are... How do we say? Obsessed with numbers. They can generally form most professions that fit into the realm of dungeon adventurers, but seem to see them with a lot of clerics, mages, and rangers. Quiz mumbled and Rudy's eyes the goblin. Doesn't matter how good a weapon has served you. Doesn't matter how many times a shield got you through a dungeon. Doesn't matter if you spell stone was gift from your dear friend. Calx toss it all away and the slightest chance for more power. The shield that may be slightly better made for an enchanted sword that looks a bit better. Calx will talk crap and explain why it's logical or just the same thing to do to just dump good pieces of gear that can still serve you. It's greed plain and simple. Rudy looked like she wanted to spit out but held back out of respect. It's efficient. I cannot deny that. But it's callous too. I admit that I have some bad habits in common with them, but the nature of these people have become infamous to a degree that the name calculators is often the same sentence as pretty foul curse words. Quiz paused and looked down at Francois. Is that fine? It's drooling. He asked, not sounding all concerned as Francois's eyes were blank as he stared at Quiz. Ruly wiped her own mouth and yawned. Nah, you just drone on. Ruly snapped at Quiz. Delta giggled and blinked in surprise that a bad mood ebbed away slightly as the two talked. Francois heard her and danced slightly. Drone, drone! It cackled and Quiz looked at her with just swallowed a lemon. Delta snorted and couldn't help the fits of giggles that kept coming. Ruly looked around and felt something. Chris looked annoyed. This is going to take too long. I cannot honestly help a dungeon call sometime in this life if her translator is at a reading level of one of Holdy's cheeses. Actually, thinking about it, Holdy's cheeses might be better from what I've seen. Chris retorted, exasperated. Francois sniffed, tasting the words as if he was not liking them very much. Well, as far as I know, there are no gob shamans here. Rudy stretched and Delta paused and opened a menu. Goblin, evolve into a goblin thug, 5 mana and 2 DP. Or goblin and archer, 5 mana and 2 DP. Or goblin apprentice, 5 mana and 2 DP per goblin. Well, there was no shaman, but there was apprentice. What exactly was that? Goblin apprentice, a goblin who has been educated in the basics of magic and is a little smarter than the average goblin, tends to set things on fire if not careful. Delta wondered if that would help things on her end by upgrading the goblin. Ronsoir took some time, but in the end he managed to convey Delta's wishes. Quis and Rudy shared a look but then they left the dungeon, but rather quiet. Delta's menus appeared the moment the last flutter of Quis's coat left the entrance. Delta perched the upgrade while focusing on Francois. Unlike the mushy, her goblin simply sat down heavy and closed his eyes. And then Delta waited. Her mushy had been almost instantaneously, but her goblin seemed to be taking some time. This raised a simple question. If her monsters evolved and adventurers came in, what would happen? Delta had a feeling the image of her monster mid-evolution and some creep killing the poor gob while it was defenseless. Delta was almost confident that she didn't possess a B button to spare her monster from such a fate. Delta moved over to the entrance and slowed as the barrier appeared. Instead of a white and cloudy, the barrier was orange. That was new. Abruptly, the orange faded to white, and Quiz and Rudy walked back in as if the orange barrier was not such a strange sight. Delta zoomed back to Francois and saw him climbing to his feet. The goblin looked different. The gnarled staff that he held in one hand looked like it was roughly carved out of a still, had a small branches, stems and leaves on it. The loincloth and the rock bag were replaced by a small robe, almost like a wrinkled poncho. Delta stared at the tiny circlet made of fangs and shiny stones rustling as Francois moved his head. He opened his eyes with a glimmer and her normal gob showed, but it felt more focused somehow. Master, it greeted as if the feeling of her approach. His voice was less squeaky and slightly gruff. Quis walked with Rudy driving behind him. And now the gobs have magic, and if I didn't need a reason to dislike them more, Quis said without a hint of shame. Francois snorted. Man had magic for a long time. 
not seem any better. Francois fired back and Rudy chuckled. Oh, look, it's Goblin Quiss. She guffawed, and Francois and Quiss snapped their heads to her. The faces did actually have the same look. Go get eaten by a bear, Quiss replied eloquently. Dalton moved and then nodded as she approved of her monster's appearance. You look good, Dalton praised, and Francois bowed his head. Master is kind. I am happy to serve. His voice was lost its gruffness, and Dalton felt happy as Francois's tone became warmer. Her goblin still liked her despite having cool magic. As everyone got comfortable, Dalton reminded herself to check the menus but the monster summoning. She kept forgetting to check before, but Dalta really needed to see if she could summon evolved forms of the monsters or not. It has saved time. Now let me see if I can make sense of why you're so against living, Chris called as he sat down on the ground with a little regard to his trousers. Dalta tried to ignore Francois' staff as it glowed with a red at the tip. Dalta was too busy focusing on a little Chris seemed to be worried about pissing her off in new magic using Goblin. If that goblin hit him with a fireball, Quiss would regret his cavalier attitude. Sure, it wouldn't kill him, but Quiss was partial to his hair. The goblin seemed to fume before it sulked. Goblins may evolve, but they seemed to keep the same spectrum of emotions pretty consistently. Master wishes not to be a killer, the goblin said. Quiss sent a little thanks to the core, Delta, for upping the number of vowels in the goblin knew. It was likely to make him cry or drown Rudy every time she smiled at his annoyance. I get that, but she must understand that the choice may not be easily made. Our village can store the news, but people will detect the new dungeon that is growing as fast as your masters. Quiz said and lifted his fist full of sand and dropped it slowly. I do greatly respect her choice and understand her reasons. To be born and to decide not to want to just kill is a sign of a very intelligent woman. Chris added as an afterthought. The goblin slowly nodded. Why must you tell? The question came and Chris drew a crown in the sand. It's the law. Dungeons, if unreported, can grow beyond the town's mean to contain or control the things go bad. The kingdom of Valyron... The land on which this dungeon and our town is passed an ancient law that dungeons must be recorded and made public. This was to prevent potential rebels or usurpers for harnessing the power of a dungeon to fuel their armies in secret. Chris scratched his nose. History was a minor hobby of his. He liked reading about the stupid people and how they met their end. This type of throne takeover happened three times. The last prince was driven off in the dead of night by some ugly uncle or aunt stole the throne, and the third child returned ten years later with an army with twinked out knights and mercenaries wielding plus six hate blades and chugging greater health potions all night. One queen wised down the line and made the law that all dungeons must be reported and manor experts were employed as taxmen and sent around the kingdom to sniff out hidden dungeons, and, well, to collect taxes, of course. The discovery of the dungeon cult of Banyup was still talked about today. Master wants to know what legal rights do dungeons have? The gob asked and Rooney thought about it. Dungeon core destruction carries a life sentence. Unless the dungeon is forbidden, then it is a duty to destroy it. Uh, building around a dungeon, other than structures as considered outposts, is illegal unless the mayor of the nearest town gives permission, unless there is no town within a mile. Rudy listed with her fingers. Chris wasn't sure if Rudy was trying to be polite, so he decided to help her out. They don't have any, is what she's trying to say, without hurting your master's feelings. Dungeons are seen as golems or tech limbs, subservient like dangerous monsters people keep around due to the rare properties or the status symbols. You have no privacy rights. You have no right to a court of law. You have no right to demand protection. You have no rights to holidays. You have... Listen, this world sees dungeons as factories for food, minerals, materials, monster harvesting, magic weapon developers, and so on. Chris's tone had turned bitter. He didn't like telling a dungeon that seemed to be so very undungeony that it had made him feel guilty that he listed how, to humans, she was a beast. Livestock to be fed winter after winter for springtime returns. Delta made old thoughts Chris had put to peace or didn't really want to think about bubble up and he found himself growing annoyed. 
So, you see, you might as well get on the level with your brothers and sisters. Build some spikes, make your monsters dangerous, and accept that people are jerks, and they deserve it if they bother you. Quiz snapped and really shot him a dangerous look. The pond was quiet. Quiz felt his usual indifference settled in as he got ready for the dungeon getting angry and asking him to leave. He had done what Rudy had asked and told the dungeon what she needed to hear. Being the dungeon sucked and Quiz couldn't imagine ever wanting to share their shoes. Murder machines or slaves? What a cruel fate. No. Master politely says that the giant load of troll dung. Quiz's indifference was not prepared for their flat disagreement. Delta, I hate to be a jerk twice in a minute, but you have to understand. Quiz began, but the goblin just cut him off. No, you will understand. My master says this. I will not kill. I will not be scared into killing. I will survive and keep myself. If you do not believe, my master says that it is fine, and thanks for your concern. Master will lay down and die if people come for her. She has a bathroom. She has scary things. Master also wants to say that she will stick to her goal. A no innocent kill run. The gob stumbled over the last part. Quiz was speechless. It was not just a goblin, it was the very air itself that seemed to pulse. Master will make rules, Master will warn, Master will give chances to run. Personally, I think Master is too kind. The goblin examined its staff with interest. He listened and then appeared to sigh. Master wants the dungeon to be a place of wonder and adventure. This dungeon of life and learning. The goblin seemed to listen for a while. Quiz followed his gaze to the section of wall. Nothing there, but who knows what the beings of the dungeon saw compared to the outside world. Well, if you want to try, I can help, Rudy shrugged, and Quiz shot her a disapproving look. How will she grow if she doesn't kill? Quiz reminded her that the goblin snorted. You think that dungeons are free, master? No, little trinkets, good will. The goblin seemed to cackle. Rudy then raised an eyebrow. An entry fee? Ah, uh, I don't think people will like that, Rudy said carefully, and the goblin looked at her and smiled. Quiz felt a little chill go down his spine at the look. Good, then men's will have to think carefully about being stupid. He hissed. He looked back at the wall and then nodded. Come, Master wishes to show you her domain. I shall guide you, and you give Master hints. The gob moved forward, using its staff like a walking stick, like a novice manner. Come into my web, said the spider, Quiz muttered, and Rudy snapped him on the back. Don't be silly, Quiz, we already went past the spiders, she said cheerfully. Quiz disliked her, he disliked the goblin, he felt uneasy about Delta's decision, and why did he not like the look that Rudy's face as she walked slowly behind him as he approached some wet smelling room? You know... I think you need something for your skin, Rudy said innocently, and Quiz gripped his sun crystal gun. Oh, he answered without much excitement. Yeah, ever heard of a mud bath? I hear they do wonders, Rudy almost whispered into his ear. Quiz hated everything as he saw the room ahead. He tried to move, but Rudy, while weaker in magic and intellect, was superior in physical department. He hit the mud with a splat, and he stood up while wiping the gunk from his eyes. Master said she has no towels. Go back to the pond, please. No mud in the tunnels ahead, the gob called, sounding as if he had learned this phrase by heart. Quiz felt the fireball spell from his lips and with a force of will that changed at the last second. A confused duck appeared next to him and then quacked furiously at him. It wasn't the first time Quiz had summoned this particular duck to avoid losing his temper. So what do you think about Delta's trap room? Rudy asked with a sugar-sweet voice above him. He almost threw the duck at her. The fireball spell came so naturally to him that he often miscast it to summon a duck spell to avoid removing any annoyances in his life. And when he finally made it to the grove passing another of the strange acid-spissing mushrooms on the way, that did not attack but gave him an old stink eye. He knew that he would not be the last. End of chapter there is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 15, Delta Ducks. Delta waved at her uh, guests, visitors. As Rudy and Chris left the dungeon, Delta got as close to the barrier as she could. Well, sad to see them go. Delta did feel better. Her menus popped up and she nodded with determination. Delta didn't have a clear goal right now, but she did have something to aim for. 
people would come for her, ones who simply wanted to experience the thrills of the new dungeon and those who sought to ransack her for everything that she had. So Delta needed to make it so that she might get the most of people's visit while not letting them get very far, and hopefully not die either. Delta needed to build herself a stall deck and play her best cards the few first turns. She opened up her menu and eyed the notifications that had been waiting for her since Rudy's tributes. Delta liked Rudy. The tall, fierce woman had a talent for calming Delta, despite the fact that neither could talk to the other promptly. Chris was funny. Watching him get annoyed at her grove and her mushies was funny. His reactions for the greater mushy. That had been slightly more alarming when Chris looked ready to unleash fire from his hands, magic that she hadn't actually seen any before now. Dalton was a little worried, but her dungeon-wide cease command meant that all her monsters had left two humans alone. Handy that. Watching Rooney lift up the tawny tentacles and poke the monster and Dalton's heart jump in her throat. Rooney just laughed and the hissing and forth snaps. The woman was treating her evil mushrooms like a cool bug that she just found. Chris just stormed past with a string of ducks swallowing him like some sort of duck king. The boss room did have a door with a menacing pig motif and everything. Delta had just learned to ignore the floating through it, and the angry pig eyes and the metal door glowed red and a line appeared down the middle, making the door split open vertically as the two sides slid open from the wall with a rumble. Arena style, not too bad for a first level. Quist had said and Rudy looked ready to drool, licking her lips the size of bacon as he appeared with Fran on his saddle. Delta was worried, but the Fran just looked solid, and he wasn't allowed to fight the two guests. Are they a combined unit? Chris had asked curiously, and Delta could only answer through her menu. Sir Francis Bacon was all that she could really say. They had both declined to enter the core room. A part of Delta was glad, but another part was confused. To enter the core room without a tribute or prayer is heavily frowned upon by the respected adventurers. Usually in the new dungeon, when you beat the boss, you wrap it up and find a teleporter, or just hoof it back. Entering the core room otherwise shows that you might have plans for the core. Quite a few bits of magic crap can be used on cores. I think most famous of the mana drain spell. Old mages that can't get their ones up anymore go in for a pinch from cores. Rudy said annoyed and Quist looked away. Dungeons do provide ample mana. A bill passed said that a core can only be drained every three days with the proper permission, he said quietly. Delta guessed that she should be happy that there was a three-day limit and mages only needed to get some papers stamped. Delta shivered, thinking that some powerful mage or witch coming in and touching her core, making her mana that she had earned and needed, because the magic users didn't see Delta as anything but a battery. This would kind of stuck. But it all had Rudy, Fran, Chris, and her pond, and the Gop brothers. Delta kept them in mind as she looked at her menus. Common metal elements added to purchase and upgrade menus. Durable leather has been added to menus. Wax has been added to menus. Ink has been added to menus. Feathers have been added to menus. Delta had noticed something else as well, a few other things. Her manner had maxed out in Chris and Rudy's visit, but it didn't exceed that limit at all. That was something new. Ambient mana leech only fold her up, not top to pass her max. Delta could accept that. Another thing that was the two monsters appeared in a summon list. Greater Mushroom, 25 mana. Goblin Apprentice, 18 mana. Delta could just outright buy her upgraded monsters, but the cost alone left Delta a little wide-eyed. It costs more to buy one second form than the summoning and upgrade cost of a brand new level 1. Delta guessed that would be fair. If the second form was cheap, it would make the first forms pointless to experiment with them purely due to the costs and numbers involved. Good thing, Delta didn't use numbers as a way to live her life as much as she did with a gut feeling. With some stretching, she eyed the 52 DP and 55 mana. Delta was running on a full tank and she could not wait to get started on some of the tips Chris and Rudy had given her. Chris's advice was mostly just to upgrade her boss and hope for the best. He really did seem doubtful about Delta's life choices. Rudy was a bit more excited. She had never helped the dungeon improve his creativity, and Rudy doubted many people had. Already, that fact alone made Delta steam ahead with her plans with a big smile. 
With some references, Dua Menus, Delta, and Rudy quickly devised several ideas Delta could try. First up, Delta purchased a weak tripwire trap. Weak tripwire trap, a small thin piece of thread that is pulled tight to make a venturous trip, can be combined with others or linked with other traps. Delta knew that without wanting to create anything overly lethal, these things did seem useless to her right now, but Rudy had a really good idea. Delta moved into her spider room and set the trap. From one side of the room to the other in a single tripwire near the floor appeared, only briefly disturbing the webs with a small movement. If people wanted to farm her webs, then they would have to be careful or they'd be end up wearing it. Just in case, she commanded her spiders to run if the webs got torn down. With a little thinking, she shifted the room slightly on all the walls. It only cost two mana, but now all the walls had tiny little holes where the spiders could flee into so that they didn't have to die if they couldn't outrun people. With a grin, she eyed the very little bush. Curious, she held her finger to it, not using her mana. Rent's Berry Bush Upgrade berries to be better and give off a nice aroma, 2 dp. Upgrade bush to grow berries faster when berries are harvested, 4 dp. Upgrade bush to grow poisonous berries as well, 5 dp. Upgrade bush so common silver spinners may produce dyed web, red, 10 dp. Rent's bush will lose ability if removed from close vicinity of spiders. Delta did a little dance at the sheer options that one object had. Her berry bush could be useful. She tapped a simple aroma upgrade and watched as the red berries became a little bit darker in color. Delta sniffed, but sure enough, there was a slightly sweet smell in the air. Curious, she walked to the entrance and could just barely smell the berries. Delta's urge to make the ultimate bush of an s rank berries in the very first room rose to a huge wave, but Delta managed to resist. She zoomed to the pond, and to be honest, neither Quist nor Rudy had any complaints about this little place, but Delta had seen a few things that gave her ideas on what to add, and what some of the nice touches. Um, how to phrase this? Stone big enough to sit on? Delta called in the menu, took a few seconds. Stoned shaped seats. Delta shook her head. No, like natural looking rocks that you might sit on in the wild. She clarified, and the menu hummed for a second. Small boulders with slightly flat tops. Uh, sure. A bit mouthy, so let's go with... Comfy rock seats. She suggested and watched as the blueprint formed. Comfy rock seats added to menu for mana. Delta clicked it, and a vague outline appeared in front of her, and Delta tried to imagine how best that it would look with these rocks. Delta made two slightly to the side, and one just at the water's edge for a fisherman. Rudy's stool made her realize people might like somewhere to sit and while they wait for something to bite. That was when she thought hit her. Delta quickly walked over to the water and clapped her hands. Gather up, she called to the lake became filled with all the life that gathered around Delta as best they could. Delta wanted to squeal and she felt like a princess. Guys, people might throw hooks in, not gonna lie, they kinda wanna eat you, but I'd like you all to sometimes bite and struggle against the bait. Their bait could feed me DP and mana and that's important. Delta said with a stern voice, You should all respawn due to the room, so try to have fun? She said weakly, and she knew the idea was silly. Then again, Humushi had felt very little pain when it had burned up. Perhaps this was a good thing. The fish all flopped a few times, the crayfish danced, as they all sunk beneath the water again. It was good. Now the people could fish and eat her fish raw? Delta paused. There was no wood in her dungeon unless people wanted to burn those cut rod mushrooms. Delta grimaced. They would get sick from the fumes. Not good. Campfire, she called. Wood kindling added to the menu three mana. Delta clicked and a stack of five to seven wood appeared, and they appeared to be the same length as a dungeon had used for wooden torches. She placed it between the two stones near the wall and tried to think. She didn't think that the smoke would be a problem as such, and a huge room with nothing in it that should catch fire. Delta nodded and decided that the room was about finished. Feeling interested, she held her finger over the new pile of wood. Basic wood kindling, a stack of tiny sticks that can be used for a tiny campfire. The dungeon must be truly kind to supply such a thing. Upgrade sticks to logs for DP. Upgrade distance the heat reaches 6 DP. Make all fish cooked upon it extra tasty, 10 dp. 
merge kindling with the pond room so that it responds when wood every 6 hours, 15 dp. There was much to be done and Delta eyed her dp. What once felt so big was now shrinking rapidly. Hob and gob, Delta prayed that they had hurried. She was having too much fun to be cut off due to the resources running dry. Next thing she knew, the menu would be offering her microtransactions with how sad she was feeling. Exchange 10,000 mana for 10 dp? Menu, do not infect my existence with uh, such filth, Delta warned in the menu before she rippled nervously. Then again, she didn't pay for her mana either, so who was suffering? Unless it's a good deal, she amended. Francois called at her attention and Delta eyed the menu and purchased the respawn option quickly before she left. Delta appeared in the mudroom and peered about. Francois stood on the other side and pointed down into the mud. Delta looked down at the angry quacking of a duck that stared up at Francois with beady eyes. Quiz forgot his familiar. Or oh, one of them, Delta frowned. Quiz seemed to love ducks, cause every time he got spooked, another one appeared. Delta couldn't blame him. Every time Delta got spooked, a monster appeared. Francois, scoop him up, Delta said with exasperation. The goblin grumbled and climbed down, his staff shooting sparks at the mood turned sour. The duck flapped and moved down the tunnel. It moved quickly down the passageway and nimbly moved into the mushroom grove, where the ball walked out at the quacking. The duck quacked at the ball, shoveled on the spot, hesitant to attack due to Delta's orders. Ducky, get back here! Delta cried as the duck ran past a dozen or so gut-rot mushrooms. The duck moved swiftly past the two goblins that she had left behind. Num and Billy stared at the duck waddled past with speed that Delta was struggling to keep up with. No, Mr. Duck, that's the boss room. Delta warned, but the door was already opening. Delta hoped the bacon didn't roll over and crush the poor thing in its sleep. Quist threw the ducks into the nearest water source that he could find. Quist detested duck meat. He had it so often that he began to hate people that ate it. After the dungeon visit, Quist was feeling a little lost. His books didn't cover nice dungeons. His magazines and his collection of spatial combat books didn't record any stories similar to this. Sure, there were many novels about epic wizard warrior necromancer who ended up sleeping with a sexy dungeon avatar as a many fairy helpers. Chris got bored after the 500th nigh identical one. Delta made him ponder. Pondering made him curious, his curiosity made him itchy to study, and his studying could not be done until his peacekeeper duties were done. Damn, Ruli could smack a few walls about and call it a night. Chris had to deal with people. Oh, Chris, this is just terrible. I was doing some gardening and a terror root ate my tomatoes. Mrs. Dabagost complained. Chris just prayed for strength. Terror roots require two cups of blood, a pinch of sulfur, and a bedtime stories a month before you reach enough power to leave their spots. Do you have any of these sound familiar? He asked tightly. Mrs. Dabagast shook her head and looked innocent. I just keep cutting myself and the gardening tools and I used sulfur perfume. And you know, I love telling stories to the last hour of myself in the middle of my garden when no one can see me. She laughed and Chris made another duck appear. This time it was on purpose. Very well, I'll be right back. He smiled tightly, not wanting to be rude to the mother of three children, local gossiper, maker of the best apple pies in the kingdom, and an ex-dark green witch of the Bloodthorn Forest who took part in the major battles during the Month of the Dead. Such a dear, Miss Dabagost smiled and pulled up a wrapped piece of pie. Chris's mood lifted at the sight of it. This would either grant him three extra years of life, or would really well with warm milk. Chris climbed into the garden and faced down the growing domestic plants that Mrs. Dabagast. While Data had those mushroom monsters, there was no doubt that they were bad. Mrs. Dabagast's sickle thorns, ebon fangs and dragon snaps with actual little dragon heads all waited for him to come near. Delta and Mrs. Dabagast must never meet. Chris vowed this, but not out loud as he didn't want to be held to it by his magic. He hated being held to things by his magic. Makes his stomach turn it did. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. 
and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.